Welcome to the Albany Book Festival Online, presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. You can learn more about the festival and find direct links to independent booksellers at our festival webpage, albanybookfestival.com. Follow us on social media and hear for more videos from the Writers Institute. Welcome to this year's Albany Book Festival at the State University of New York at Albany. I'm Mark Koplick, Assistant Director of the New York State Writers Institute. We have a wonderful slate of virtual events at this year's festival, and we invite you to check them out at albanybookfestival.com and on the YouTube page of the New York State Writers Institute. We're extremely excited to be here today with Edwige Danticra and Kali Fajardo Anstein major American fiction writers and major contemporary practitioners of the short story form. Edwige Dantica, explorer of the rich world of the Haitian and Haitian American experience, is a pivotal figure in the changes that have occurred in the American canon in colleges and high schools across the country. We love her work. We brought her here to UAlbany in person in 1997 and again in 2004. It's a delight to have her here virtually again. Her latest short story collection is Everything Inside, Stories, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Story Prize, and the Bill Check Prize in Literature. The book was also a pick of the Reese Witherspoon Book Club. A writer Alexia Arthurs, who visited us at UAlbany in person last year, reviewed the book for Oprah's O Magazine, calling it, quote, an answered prayer, for those who have long treasured Dante Ka's work. Kali Fajardo Anstein is a bright new star in American literature. Her debut short story collection is Sabrina and Karina, a finalist for the National Book Award, the Penn Bingham Prize, and the Story Prize. Drawing from her Southern Colorado heritage and life experiences, Fajardo Anstein's writing reflects her heritage as a Chicano with roots in indigenous, Latina, and Filipino cultures. The great Sandra Cisnero said, here are stories that blaze like wildfires with characters who made me laugh and broke my heart. How tragic that American Letters hasn't met these women of the West before, women who were here before America was America, and how tragic that these working class women haven't seen themselves in the pages of American Lit before. These new short story collections, Everything Inside and Sabrina and Karina, contain some of the best short story writing in America today. More than that, they help to redefine American literature, to make communities visible who are formerly invisible in literature. They help to make it truly reflective of the splendor and variety of American experience, the many shades and accents of heartache and joy. They enlarge our family, and enrich us all. You can find out a lot more about both books and both authors here on this website. You can also purchase the books from an ind independent bookseller via a link on this page. Edwige and Kali, thank you so much for being here at the online Albany Book Festival. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. So our, our students at UAlbany represent over 90 nationalities, over 100 languages. Um, would you encourage them and young people in general to use storytelling to bring their communities to the attention of the larger university family and, and, and the world? Mm, well, <laughs> absolutely. I guess I, I'll start. I mean, first I would encourage them to use storytelling, you know, not, not simply to bring attention, but I think to become even better aware of who they are um, and and first of all before you can share your story you have to learn your story and a lot of people especially immigrant young people have been at least from their individual stories um, so i think i think stories stories are magic i think stories are powerful so i, I would absolutely say you know learn your story and then um, share your story and Kali. 
Yeah, and I have to agree with everything the great Edwish is saying. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do agree that before you can, you can write and bring your stories to the world, you have to reflect and understand who you are and what your worldview is. And I think one of the ways we can do that is through reading literature and then through trying to understand, like, what do I think about the world? What am I noticing? What do I feel like I want to share? Because the world doesn't necessarily need to know everything about your life and your inner life and your culture. Some things are sacred that you don't necessarily need to share, but some things you really need to share because they've been haunting you for so long. And I think the story form and storytelling is a good way to do that. I mean, what, what is the value for, for students and young people in investigating their ancestral and family history through, through writing and fiction? Um, and is that something that all young people should, should be thinking about? I can, I can start with this one. I think for me, um, I'm a Chicana. I'm also an incredibly mixed person. And I grew up feeling very invisible in the mainstream idea of what it meant to be a Coloradan and what it meant to be somebody from the American West. And I, I feel that by, by writing these stories and sharing these stories, I really was able to sort of understand myself better, but also gain self-esteem. I was able to say, I, I know what I am, I know who I come from, and you can't take that away from me, and you cannot make me alter my story to fit better into your idea of what we are. Um, and so I think that it's one of the ways that we can really build up our, our agency and our self-esteem. And did we? Well, often I, people uh, want to tell us what our stories are, right? And then they t tell it through a kind of distorted, diminished lens. So I think um, for those of us who have access, for example, to elders, to, to firsthand accounts, you know, it's important to investigate those stories because our, our histories often are sometimes footnotes in larger, the stories that were taught in school, that our children are taught in school. So I think that investigation, fiction does beautifully, you know, as Kali said, because it, it brings individuals alive, right? It puts meat on those bones. It, it puts, you know, it gives voices, like literally it makes people speak who, who may have been lost. Like it might be just uh, characters. I'm always fascinated with characters that you just read in history. It's like a passing footnote. And then that's the person I most want to know about. So I think that that's, that's also a place that fiction, you know, works beautifully and that you can just investigate and then fill in with, you know, some things with imagination. Yeah, it is, is the short story form somehow a, a better opportunity than the novel to make a community visible, to bring many characters to the table and give each of them their own focus. Uh, I'm thinking of characters, like you say, you know, who might be more, more marginal um, in, in other works or in a novel or have walk-on roles. Well, the short story for me most approximates the way I was told stories and these kinds of bits and, um, and pieces and, and it's sort of a polyphonal way where all these many voices can speak at the same time, and I think that's what I'm, that's why I'm so drawn, one of the things I'm drawn to it in, the, in it, that you can have so many people. Um, and you know, I, I love novels and I, I, I've written novels too, but they always end up sort of a little bit with that fragmentation of that short story. But I think it goes back to how I was told stories and how it's like, the, like many voices speak, you know, in, in, the, in these types of stories. And Kali, is there, is there a kinship between family stories and the short story form for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, my family, they're great practitioners of the oral tradition. That's the way we kept our traditions alive, but also the way that we, we shared triumphs as well as tragedies, uh, tragedies and trauma in my family. Um, when I first started writing, I wanted to be a novelist right out the gate from the time I was a little girl because that's what I was exposed to. I was reading chapter books and larger novels. Um, and when I got to college and then into graduate school, I was seeing works like Lost in the City by Edward P. Jones. And I was seeing how you can take a community and you can sort of have each story do a different angle, a different view of the community. And I really wanted I really wanted to explore the different walks of life in my own community from these sort of glimpses moving around. 
um, rather than sort of just a tackling everything from the societal view down. I wanted to start with the individual and go up. And the short story firm really allowed me to do that. Is there ever a sense with, with either of you that you're, you're writing to address injustice by enlarging American literature? Is that at the top of your minds? Um, or is, is that only one of many factors? And, and can writing fiction be a form of activism? Well, I think it would be terrifying to go into, I'm writing to adjust injustice. And um, I, don't, I don't think it's sort of an agenda item necessarily for me. Um, but I think it's, it's a wonderful collateral thing if, it's, if it comes to be. I mean, certainly I think um, we want to add to the multiplicity of voices in the same way that, you know, the stories of Polyphonal, you were like, oh, I, you know, Toni Morrison has that wonderful quote, if there's a book you haven't, you want to read that hasn't been written, you should write it. And I think in that way, and that's sort of her, her word did that and it didn't, nothing was compromised in the political element of it. But it was, but the, all the love was poured into bringing those characters to life and making them as complex and as nuanced as possible. And, and I think in that way, you can get the whole um, rest of it. Kali, did you want to address that? Yeah, I, I don't think I set out, I did not set out with any agenda with my work. I just, I obsessively wanted to tell stories and there were certain things from my own life and from my community that were just, they're really troubling and I wanted to understand why they had happened and how they worked. And I think sort of as, yeah, like an after effect, it, it seemed that I was writing about these these issues like gentrification and violence against women, which I am, but I'm actually, I was writing about the everyday realities of the people that I come from. And while I think that my art can maybe help address some of those issues, in, it, in itself, it's not activism. There still needs to be action outside of the book that can make changes. Because at the end of the day, you can just close the book and put it back on the shelf and policy doesn't change, family does not, family dynamics don't change. Um, so it needs to be followed up with actual actions. Mm -hmm. What you do hope happens though, is that someone say will read your book and then go, oh, I hadn't, hadn't thought of this before. Like I hadn't thought of it in this way before. And then, and maybe they'll be more sensitive. They'll be more prone to, to taking action. I think that's always our hope that you will move someone in the way that the news has not, mm -hmm. or that statistics have not. And so that they'll have a different uh, perspective. I mean, it's been known to happen. <laughs> do, do, you, do you have stories from, from readers who, who really felt empowered by your work? I mean, the, the characters you write about are often uh, depicted in other media as, as being very powerless, and, and um, th there's a certain empowerment that comes from, from uh, 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 writing and uh, about your uh, own uh, community members and, and exploring the, the agency that they have in their lives. Uh, has anyone taken a message of empowerment from, from your books that you can, that you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, I've met people who have said, you know, I've taken this particular action. I've done this kind of work because I've read your work. And I, I mean, often people will say, this has changed the way I thought about this. Um, I think that, and, and that's always moving, you know, it's always very moving to see. Um, are there particular kinds of characters that are better suited to the short story form? For example, is, is the small scale of the short story better suited to the small world of a child or, or a childhood memory, or is, is that not really so? I think in practical terms, um, it's hard to sustain the voice of a young narrator for hundreds of pages. Not always, but sometimes it is. Um, and so sometimes my character or my, my narrators tend to be, you know, eight or 10 years old. Um, but I haven't given them a full novel yet, so I'm not really sure. Um, but a lot of my first person narration, it feels more comfortable in the short story form for me. Yeah, for me, it's more the the like the situation. Um, if it's something I feel like, oh, I don't think this can go 
to much longer than this particular you know length then i'll think of it as more of a short story as opposed to trying to make it a novel and i've had novels that i've begun that end up being short stories because i can't i can't continue them but i think it's sometimes the form will will guide you towards what it wants to be so um have, have both of you um what, what what is your your feeling about this uh, new Zoom reality as as, a, as an author connecting to readers? Is is it is it very very challenging, or is it opening up new windows that you hadn't suspected? Um, either either of you, is it frustrating? Um, I think it's. I mean, I like it and I dislike it at the same time. Um, I, I had like a MySpace page when I was young and I, I always was sort of active on social media in that way. And so in some ways it's a continuation of the way that I was marketing myself before and connecting with readers before. Um, but I really do miss the personal connection. I miss being on stage. I miss being able to meet writers like Ed Weish in a green room and being very, very nervous. Um, and there's just sort of this magic when you're in front of your readers and you get to hug them and sign their books. So I do look forward to the days when we get to do that again. Yeah, well, I think you're killing the Zoom. Like when I come on a, <laughs> when I call on Zoom, I'm like, I'm looking at everybody's framing. I was like, I wonder what light there is. It's kind of like this new thing. I have, you know, I have a, t I have a teenager and a tween. So I, I have to tell them like, okay, what do I do? Um, so, so I kind of like, though, I mean, I, I like, there are certain things that now I realize, I was like, I, we could have done this from the house, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to get on a plane for that particular thing. <laughs> so, um, but I do miss traveling. I don't even know when we'll be able to do that again. I, I think that exchange with readers, like writers festivals, is basically where writers met. That's, that's where we you know, you exchanged ideas on the bus and, the thing, you know, and, and, you know, backstage. So I think that interaction I will miss. And it's, and then when you look at it and you're in, on one's most pessimistic day, you're thinking, will we ever be able to like touch that many people again <laughs> as you did at these, at these events? But I don't, I don't know. I hope, um, I hope we emerge better, all of us from all of this, you know, from this whole entire period. So um, we're, we're coming up on time. I'm going to ask one more question. And if, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask of each other, we'd, we'd be delighted to hear them. So um, my question is, uh, are, are you writing for your communities or for readers outside your communities who, who lack understanding or for both at once? And, and if it's both, is it, is it difficult to write on two different frequencies, as, as it were? I'll go. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I think about this a lot. Um, when I first started writing, I, I truly did not, I wanted to become an author, but I didn't really see very many models that would allow me to think that it was possible to have this kind of life in a big way. And so I sort of rejected the idea of audience. And the person I was writing for was a version of myself but younger when I really needed these books um, to make me feel less lonely. And so I think I am writing for my community, I'm writing for myself, and I'm writing for those who love literature. And I think um, you can be from any walk of life, any, any nation, anywhere, but if something really connects with you, um, literature has the ability to do that when it's at a certain level, I hope. Um, but I do, I don't think about the outsider reader very often when I'm writing. I say I'm, I'm often writing, I, I say this all the time for the girl I was when I was 15, who was just going around looking for certain type of books. Um, and again, I wanted to, it's like the whole following the Morrison advice, right? If there's a book you want to read that's not there, you try to write it. So that's, that's the person I write for. I think any, like really focusing on any other kind of audience would be intimidating. And first of all, even when you say, like if you say I'm writing for my community and sometimes your community says, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Keep your awful stories. Um, so it's not, it's not always like a, a, a warm embrace because people also, you're expected to tell every story. 
So that becomes another problem. So I think that for me, the best approach was always kind of just like write for, write for yourself, write for that girl. And maybe now, maybe for my daughters, um, as something I leave to them. But, but if you're thinking of this really massive audience, it's, I, I, I would find that very intimidating. Is there anything you'd like to ask each other while you have the opportunity? Well, I want to ask, Kylie, what are you working on now? How is that novel going? <laughs> it's, good. it's going, I'm, I'm in rewrites and it's going, it's going quicker than I thought it would. And I'm starting to feel that like grief where I'm like, what do I do when this book is done? And then I guess I start a new one from scratch. But I also, I took a break and I'm not, I'm not sure if I should have done this, but I, I wrote a new short story. I just sort of binged wrote it and now I have to go back and I have to revise it. Uh, while I'm supposed to be working on the novel. So my question for you, I want to know about your revision tactics, and I'm sure they change depending on the project, but do you have any overall suggestions about revision? Well, I mean, before the revision, I'll, I'll tell you, when I finished my first book and it was about to go out, I remember my editor said, always have something going, right, before you, to avoid that grief, and also mm -hmm. because you can't, control how the other work is received. So she was she's like, always have something going when you're done with the other one, like start something right away, even if it's no good. So that you, so that was good that you, you know, you might've lost that short story if you didn't go to it. But revision for me, I'm obsessed with revision. I'm an obsessive re reviser really, because I don't know if it's because English is really, it's not my, it's like my, it's my third language. So I'm always, for me, I'm always aiming for a kind of clarity for myself. And so I revise a lot. I, I revise a lot and, and just sometimes over revise. And I realize that I re over revise when I'm putting things back in that I've, I'm taking out. <laughs> but my favorite thing in revision though is having things to cut out. Like I really like, I write longer so that I have things to, to cut. But I, but I feel I, that's my favorite part of the whole thing actually. Yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah. What's the favorite part of your, what's the, what's the, what, what do you like? most when you're writing which part of it um, i i like making myself laugh um that's always fun <laughs> that's great in quarantine <laughs> yeah <laughs> when my characters are like they're telling jokes to each other and i i feel like i'm in a room laughing with them um i also like when i get to feel emotions pretty strongly mm. i i will cry a little bit and i will i mean it's it's only a fraction of what my characters are probably feeling but I still like that running through my body and that connection to other consciousness in a way. Um, I have I have another question for you if I can ask another. Um, so you you had a long career at this point, and I, I hope it goes much much longer. Um, and what I love about I love so much about your work. So that there's there's not one thing I can pinpoint. But often when I read your stories and essays and nonfiction, you have these really resonant images that that come through and they sort of weigh on me for days and weeks after I've read the book. And so I wonder in your own life, are you collecting these images? And if so, do you find a story for them right away? Or do you set, do you like jot them down and keep them or do you invent them out of thin air? That was probably a pretty wide question. Yeah. Uh, but, no, but you have some, I'm trying, I'm thinking of some really amazing images in your stories. You have some really powerful images too. Like, uh, you know, with the, I remember the character who was uh, dressing the body. I mean, that was so like I was in the room, you know, for that for that scene uh, with the makeup and the hair. It was just so stunning. Um, I I do like. I feel like that's what this profession teaches us. You kind of narrow on certain things. Like I I think we walk around looking at things differently. So for example, recently with the whole Sahara dust thing we went to the beach after not being allowed with the corona to go for like weeks and and the sky like seemed like it was on fire you know and i said oh i have to find somewhere to put that <laughs> and so i ended up putting it in an essay that's like in the new york review of books this month because it was just kind of like what is this world trying to tell me but i i see i mean when you write stories you start to notice i don't know I, i'd be so curious to hear about like how you take that you start notice symbolism in life mm -hmm. right like you start seeing things you're just like that I think ordinarily you might have passed by because you write these things Do, th does that happen to you yeah and 
I mean, the, the new story I wrote, it was set in the, there's like a fancy penthouse in my building. I have a mixed income building, which is sort of interesting. And after I wrote it, um, the person who lived there actually stopped me and they said they had heard about my work and we had this conversation, but I, it even feels like it's stronger symbolic connections now <laughs> where, where the people are like feeling me doing something. But yeah, it, that's why I was wondering if you keep track of the images and you find a home for them right away, or if, if you have like, a, I'm just trying to organize, man, I got to get everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh there, you know what, they will just pop up on their own sometimes. They, like, if you, I mean, that's the thing also, I find that you kind of have, that's why it's important to show up um, to work, because I, I, some days if you don't show up, it won't you know, you, you might miss something like that. Where, but you might be writing something completely different and you're like, oh, that's what I needed. And also it's good to keep little bits of things that you write because one failed story, another failed story could be like the two of them together can be a good story. You know, that whole, that, that, that whole thing. But, but I, I, I have a very visual approach to writing stories. Like I have to see it so much that I can feel like I am able to walk through it mm -hmm. and that that's how I and I try to just feel like I'm taking notes like I'm just walking through a scene it has to feel that real to me so that's that's probably why it's it's the visual the books are Sabrina and Karina by Kali Fajardo Anstein and Everything Inside by Edwige Dantica they're available for purchase via a link on this website in addition to this conversation Kali and Edwige We'll be meeting virtually and answering questions in real time with University of Albany students who have read their work. To our online audience, thanks for vi visiting the Albany Book Festival. And please be sure to check out all of our events online. And to Edwige and Kali, it's been such a pleasure spending time with you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you so you. much. Good to see you, Kali. It was good to see you. <laughs> This book festival is made possible with the support of the McGuire Family Endowment at the Writers Institute, the University at Albany Foundation, the Office of the President of UAlbany, the Peacott Family Foundation, the Capital District Library Council, Stuyvesant Plaza, Chet and Karen Opalka, Charles Tui and Alice Green, Pernilla Dake, Elizabeth Ruthman, and Betsy Lopez. If you appreciate our programming and would like to support the Writers Institute, you can find out how at nyswritersinstitute.org.